Welcome to the to the Buddhist Society and welcome to James. It's my privilege to introduce James Whelan and who will be beginning these Pali classes. But I don't want to delay any longer because the real gold is to come. <laughs> and I'm going to drop out very quickly. But just to say thank you, James, so much you. for giving us these classes, giving us your time, your scholarship, your involvement, meditation, and so on. And, I, and, I, and wishing you, class, too, a very fruitful and enjoyable time. Um, I, I personally have gained immeasurably from James's uh, Sanskrit classes. I'm not a very good student, but what I've gained, I haven't forgotten. And it's been of great, great value to me. So James and class, enjoy. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And okay, thank you. Thank you, Walt. I know. Right, welcome, welcome to you all. The old faces that I know from before, the new faces I'm seeing for the first time. And some of you, some of you who are not yet showing your faces. Um, so welcome to the Pali class. One administrative thing. Oh, Eileen, Eileen has shown her face. Good, come on, others follow Eileen. Jane, good. Um, in the Sanskrit classes that we um, are also running, and we've been following the system now for, for a year before the Pali moved to the Buddhist society, this being the first time, um, some people um, were you know, on the reluctant side in Sanskrit to you know, perform in front of the class, to roll off a translation either into Sanskrit or from, from Sanskrit. And we had a rule then in Sanskrit that if you didn't want to be called upon um, to perform, actually perform is the wrong word, to display your knowledge, to display what benefit you were getting from this teaching by doing it, um, then you could simply blank your screen. And I would only ask questions of those who were whose faces I could see on the screen. Um, in the Pali class, we were, or we were, I can't evade the responsibility, I was being much more brutal in that nobody was allowed to hide. If you were asked to do it, um, you had, had to do it. Um, but I, maybe that wasn't a terribly good idea. Maybe there are all sorts of good reasons why you just don't want, want to do it yet. What actually brought it home to me um, that perhaps I was just being you know, a little bit too right, your turn next, you do it, was um, when I was reminded um, you know, two or three weeks ago um, by um, by somebody who is here and whose face I can see. Actually, come on, I was reminded by Eileen, who's partly responsible for this, because Eileen reminded me that at some stage um, during last year, I had all these faces up and the next question, and I said, okay, Eileen, you're looking the most terrified, you start. So I thought, okay, maybe, maybe I shouldn't be, be quite like that. So we'll, we'll find, find a way of doing it um, so that um, I don't ask anyone to perform who's, uh, who, doesn't, who really do, doesn't want to. But there's also another aspect to, to it as well. Um, and that is that it makes it different for me if I can just if I'm just looking at a screen, I've got my gallery screen up and I've got however many it is, about 20, 25 screens and goodness me, an entire page to the left as well. If all I can see is a series of blank screens with names, I mean black, black with just your name written in white, um, it's actually quite a different experience for me as well um, between that and actually see, seeing your, your, your faces, so, which, which I, I, I pr prefer to do. Um, so we will have to we will have to um, find a way of uh, saying how you're volunteering. Maybe put your put your hand up or or something like that. Um, oh, I see Iris has just joined. Iris, welcome, welcome. <laughs> Iris was one of the ones who um, had to sit through my twenty minute going twenty minutes overtime talk at the um, at the Buddhist Society summer school a couple of weeks ago. 
So I'm just going to give you a little bit of an introduction to what we're doing. Um, I think it's my fault that it was maybe a little bit confusing the way I described week one and week two, because somebody said, well, what are we doing in week three then? So what I meant to say, we'll have a, one category of week, which we call A type week, and another category of week, which we call a B type week. And in the A type, um, which is what, what we're doing now, it's um, we're starting right from the beginning. Uh, so you can, as a pure beginner knowing nothing, we're starting with the Lily de Silva Pali primer. Um, and that's for, for one hour, and then we have a 15 minute break. And in the, in the second hour, we'll be um, looking at uh, Pali Buddhist texts by um, Rona Johansson. And the B type week, um, we'll all alternate them. So in two weeks from now, we'll be back to an A-type week. The B-type week is where we resume at lesson 13, I think it is, of Lily de Silva, where my previous group um, had reached with me at the end of, well, in, in June, July, and we'll be continuing our work on the Dhammapada. Many of you have told me, and something I thoroughly approve of and applaud, is that even though you have been up to lesson 13 with me in Lily de Silva over the previous academic year, that you want to consolidate your knowledge um, by going through it again. Well, very laudable. I'm glad you're here. I can see several of you who've done, done that um, with, with, with me. Um, we'll be going, as I mentioned in some of my blurb, a lot faster than we're used to. If it becomes too fast, I don't think lesson one's gonna to be too fast. That's pretty simple stuff. As time goes on, we might find that trying to get through one lesson a week, which is the aim, turns out to be too fast. If so, we can just adjust as we, as we go, go, go along. Nothing is uh, rich in stone. So that's on the, on the grammar bit. Um, when we go on to Rune Johansson, these Pali Buddhist texts that will be in the in the second hour, um, the, we will be looking at some grammar there. I mean, the grammar we're doing now is really basic stuff. Just less Lily de Silva lesson one doesn't come much more basic than that. In the second part, we'll be looking at a real authentic Buddhist text. There has not been; it's been annotated and analyze, but it's the real authentic Buddhist text or original Pali as spoken that we will be looking at. The primary focus there won't be on mastering the grammar. There will be looking at a bit of grammar because it's way beyond where a lot of you have reached, but that doesn't actually matter because the primary focus there will be an analysis of the, of the words and the meanings. And that's why for part two, and the same, same applies equally to the type A week, where we do Rune Johansson in the second hour, as to the type B week, where we're on the, the Dhammapada. That is designed, and several people have said, oh, I haven't reached that level, I've got to prepare for that. Well, actually, no. The whole point is that when we're going through the texts, anyone can jump in at any time, because the primary focus is, is on, the, on the meaning of the words and the analysis of the words. And the meaning and the analysis of the words is much more fun than just the grammar. And that is why even from lesson one, even from Lily de Silva lesson one, I will be making frequent excursions into what many of us have come to know as the, the rabbit holes. That's you know, just talking about the etymology of the word, the meaning of the word, how they're related to words that were you know, used in modern European languages through, through Latin, Greek, the Slavonic languages, through the Germanic languages to, to English. Um, because firstly, because it's, well, from my point of view, enormous fun. And secondly, it will actually help you to remember the, remember the words. And to see that in many cases, um, we are using words now where, the actual, where the, even the root remains unchanged. I mean, sometimes literally unchanged. I mean, the modern common Slavonic root for speakers of the Slavonic languages from you know, Iris with her Croatian through Russian, I mean, 
a word that everyone knows in Sanskrit and Pali is Buddha. Hmm? Well, the, the root bud is the, a modern Slavonic root meaning wake up. It's exactly the same, unchanged through thousands of years um, over all, all, all that time. It's a very ordinary word of the language. It just means awake, Buddha, woken up. So we'll be doing quite a bit of that. As for the, you know, how enjoyable it can be, I had the you know, enormous advantage um, a while ago when I was invited to give uh, an evening talk as a guest speaker for the Buddhist Society Summer School. And I can see there are a couple of you here, um, including um, Iris and Chris Allen was there. Who else was there? Um, Oh, Deborah, were you there as well? Wonderful, jolly good. Um, and I was, oh my God, what am I going to say? And then it so happened that we kind of ran out of time long, long before I ran out of things to, 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 to say. And so much fun was it, for me anyway, that um, after I'd reached the 45 minutes I was allocated, I had several people actually asking me to go on, which is always very good when somebody actually asks a speaker not to stop. You were a wonderful audience doing that to me. Thank you. I'm deeply grateful. So let's start with a bit of Lily de Silva. And we will go on to these various little, I'm sure there are bound to be rabbit holes. I don't think we've ever had, had a lesson without a rabbit hole that we've gone down. And there they are. You know, they are a really, really fun part of it. Um, so on a an admin point, hopefully you should all have, I'm just going to alter my screen and go to shared screen. Um, hopefully you should all have access to the study resources guide. I'm just going to call up the latest. Oh, here we are. I'm just going to call up the latest edition of it. Um, I will share screen now, so hopefully you will see that. Oops. So I've just got to readjust my own window now. Oh, yeah. Right. Can you all see a shared screen with the study? Okay, thank you. Good. Um, this is something that I update periodically. Hopefully you should all have it because it's on the on the Buddhist Society website on on the Pali page. Um, it's become a bit cumbersome. I think it goes down to quite a few pages at the moment, actually. Yeah, it goes to uh, twenty something something pages, but you should all have it. The links to everything we're doing are on it. Um, So, for example, that Lily de Silva, if you go down to, there we are, this mark there. If you go down to scroll down to page five, for example, um, oh yeah, I, there's an access there to my Google Drive, so you have to chase sometimes chase around to, to, to find it. There's an access to my Google Drive where you will find the links to the um, to P PDF versions um, of the various, either PDF or my, my, my Word versions. If any of you are worried about pirating or copying, for the Lily de Silva one, I did actually write to the Vipassana Research Institute in Sri Lanka asking if I could use it. And I very promptly received an extremely courteous and helpful letter saying, very welcome to use it, um, no copyright problems at all. So everything that you're seeing, seeing here is um, fine for copyright. Um, as for the material I've presented and put here, you know, that's just for, you can make any use of it that you want. <clears throat> well, almost any use of it that you want, if you see what I mean. Um, anyway, it's all, all for free use, all for free use. And I, and um, I've, as I've said here, you know, I, I, I don't claim, claim cop, co copyright. So there we are. Let's get back to our Lily de Silva page. Uh, page five. I mean, hopefully all of you will have B 
been here and you, you, you will have this material. Here we are. So if you press that link, you get to hear on my, this is my Google Drive page where you'll see the, there's the key, there's the, there's the, the Pali primer itself. Um, there's the key and the Pali primer. There we are. So it, it, it's all, all, all there, the, the, the entire book readily available to you. Hopefully you will all have found, found access to that by, by now. I jolly will hope so, because that's the book we're using in, in, in this class. Um, one thing I mentioned um, is that we will be going a bit faster than, than we're used to. So I would urge you, if you have the, the time and the incl inclination, to try and look at the, um, at the numerous videos that I've posted, in particular the ones for the, um, the, ones for the for forthcoming classes. For example, um, so lesson one here, you know, I've done a, a YouTube video on that. You should just be able to click that link and um, up comes the video. I better not do it actually in case I get the video overriding what I'm doing. Anyway, you, you get, get the idea. Just one administrative point. Some of these links um, have been playing up and have got broken. Um, however, if you simply copy and paste in, 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 into your browser, um, it'll it'll work. Also, um, many of you will know the new ones won't. That um, during these lessons, I make notes on my iPad, and these notes also get posted up onto the relevant page um, on my Google Drive. So, if anyone has access to these notes. Um, after they've been made. So you'll be able to access separately the recordings of these classes via the Buddhist Society website and also these notes that I've made, um, which will be on my, on my Google Drive. If anyone has any difficulty in finding anything, please do feel free to email me direct. And I've actually, you, I, here we are. This is my email address here which is there on the study resources guide, please do feel free either to ask me here by email or um, to send a query onto that, um, onto that page on the Buddhist Society website where it says, ask, ask the teacher. So hopefully there should be no problem about contacting me to ask or leave, leaving a question, contact me either directly by this email address or by the uh, Ask the Teacher. Right. By way of formal inauguration, here we go. We deal now with a bit of grammar. I'm looking at lesson one. Lily de Silva, page one, lesson one vocabulary. And it talks about masculine nouns ending in ah. Now, hopefully, many of you will have seen the um, the video I did, which I mentioned to you on roots and stems and what we actually mean by roots and stems. Um, I can give you a very quick example of what I mean by roots and stems. Oops, sorry. Right. Masculine nouns ending in ah, and so the stem ends in an ah. Let's give you this very simple one, the root we just mentioned. Okay, can you all see me writing now? I put a tick. Actually, it might look like a tick. It's meant to be the equivalent of a square root sign because it's the convention among linguists that the square root sign is a sign that what follows is the, the root of the word. So we have a root, bud. That is not of itself a full word of the language. It's a, it's a kind of abstraction. It is that root from which the stems grow. We use this uh, botanical analogy among the linguists, the root from which the stems grow and then from which actual words are formed. For example, you can make a past participle um, by adding ta.
It's very commonly you make a past participle by adding ta. It's a bit the equivalent of the of adding an ed in English, which incidentally is related. Now, one of the points I want to make to you is that you all know a lot more than you think you know. It's just you have to be shown that you know it. In Sanskrit and Pali, the same applies equally here, in Sanskrit and Pali phonetics, what happens if you have a root ending in a th and you add on the ta of the past participle? Well, you all already know it because it becomes Buddha. You see, so what happens is the dh and the ta becomes Buddha. Now you know. You knew it without knowing it. It's Buddha, ta becomes Buddha. So Buddha now, from the root Buddha, we get the stem Buddha. It ends in a short a. Um, I'm not sure of the exact numbers, but probably more than half of all nouns and adjectives in Pali and Sanskrit are ones ending in the stem a or long a for the, for the feminine. But it's only the stem. It's not yet a full word of the language. To make it function as a word of the language, you need to put on the um, declensional endings. Um, so when, for example, the, in the accusative, well, you all know the accusative of Buddha, it's Buddham, because most of you have chanted thousands of times, Buddhang Saranangachami, Chami, and uh, things like that. Um, and you also, also know that the nominative form ends in an O, Buddha. Um, it's Piso Bhagava Sama Sam Buddha, and so on, Sam Buddha. So, stem Buddha, we can now decline it. So, the masculine singular nominative, we're looking at nominative now, is Buddha. And we'll jump ahead to one that you already know. Um, the accusative, the object of the verb is buddham. And the nominative is used um, as, the, as the subject of the verb. Or it's the form used when you're just naming something, just talk, talking about it. This or actually in the equivalent in Sanskrit is the ah, but the ah in certain circumstances becomes an o oh in Sanskrit, but in all circumstances it morphs into an o oh in Pali. So this o oh actually is the equivalent of you know, the Latin ending us, um, the Greek ending os, and um, so, so so on. So nominative. Oops, sorry, what have I done here? Nominative buddho. And it is the typical form uh, and the most common form for you know, masculine nouns. So whenever you say that a person is doing something, you will use the that nominative form. It makes its plural with a long R. So all of this you'll have seen in the in the lesson. So buddho, plural is buddha. Sabbe buddha, and so on. All all buddhas. So that is clear enough. Any any questions so far? Prep might be easiest to put up. I think if you put up a hand, I think you automatically come to the come to the top top of the screen. I mean, if you put up um, Alison, I meant if you put up an electronic hand, you know, one of those yellow hands. Prem, put 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 up your yellow hand, Alison. There should be a raise hand icon somewhere. Okay. Yes, you are okay, Alison. It worked, but you're still muted. It worked, Alison, and you are now at the top, top left. You're still muted. Okay, so there, there we are. We can hear you. Okay, so 
I was partly saying, what do I do so I can speak? Uh, uh, you have now dis discovered. So I put up my yellow hand or my white hand, as the case may be, and you unmute me. Is that correct? Uh, um, I think you un you unmuted your yourself then. Something happened. Oh. I'd been told yeah. that I was muted and I got unmuted. Marvellous. Uh, it may be my cohort, maybe that Odin. Yes, um, yes. Oh, Sorry, oh, James, for, at least for this lesson, I, th I think if, if people just raise their hand and then we can unmute them. OK, fine. Maybe as we go forward, um, you know, a bit more of a free for all with the unmuting. OK, yeah, let's uh, let's try as we as we go along. OK, thank Thank you, Odin. Now let's just look briefly at the at the verbs. Well, let's look at a very simple verb. I'm going to write it as a root. Oops, it's a nice screen. So you you can you still all see my um, iPad screen? Okay, thanks. Let's look at the root. Patch. By the way, when we write the letter C, that represents a sound ch. So we always write a K for the k sound and just a C for the ch sound. Now, you might say, do we all just, why should we have to remember this word? Patch means to cook. For some of you, who are not yet familiar with what I've said many times in the previous classes, might just look like in a random series of noises that you've got to learn and just tell that it means cook. Here's where etymology actually becomes quite useful because it is cognate. The ch to a k is a frequent change in the history of language. This patch is the exact etymological, same etymological origin as our word to, to bake, bake patch. Those of you who know Russian or any of the related languages hmm, will know the word so, piech. Piech meaning a stove. It's something that you heat up with. And so that's the Russian for a stove, the piech from that same root, patch, cook. There we are. You see, these, these words survive even into modern times. So that is the root. Now, how do we say he cook, he, she, or it cooks? Well, you add the ending ati for the third person singular. That's the um, he, she, it singular is the ati. So that makes pachati. Those of you who know Latin, um, we'll know that the third person singular most commonly ends in a T. In the Slavonic languages, it also ends in a T. Um, we get some, some lovely coincidences. Janati, he knows, he, she, it knows. And in, for example, I write this in Roman script in Russian, znayet, janati znayet. It's the the j has changed to a z, but it's the it's there. It's the, effectively the same word for you. So this ati. Um, we see remnants of it in English. Um, for example, we have the. Latin ire to go from the root is e. Incidentally, Sanskrit root, Sanskrit and Pali root, e to go. Hmm. Um, in Sanskrit and Pali, it becomes eti. In Latin, it becomes it. Look at that it. So whenever we say, sorry, exit in English, that t there, it actually means he sure it goes out. It's a verb. In Latin, it's become a noun in English. But that T at the end of exit represents the third person singular in Latin, and is exactly the same as this third person singular T in 
Sanskrit and Pali, Pachati. There we are. So, so many of these things we're using even in modern English without realizing. You say, ah, yes, there it is. Over the thousands of years, some things have remained unchanged. So, Pachati, he, she, or it cooks. Um, and it makes a plural in anti. And those of you who know Latin will know that most of the third person plurals in Latin end in an NT. So, pachati, he, she, or it cooks. Pachanti, they cook. Because the the verb itself indicates who is doing it, whether it's I, you, he, she, it, we, they, that's inherent in the ending of the verb, which it is. For that reason, um, most commonly you can omit the pronoun in, um, in Pali and, and, and Sanskrit. So jump, jumping ahead for a little bit, I cook is Pachami. Um, so you don't. You can say aham, I aham pachami, but you don't need to say it to indicate that I am cooking because the army ending indicates that it's I who am doing it. You would tend to put in aham um, uh, just to emphasise that it's I who am doing it, not so, so, so somebody else. Like, for example, there are some unfortunate poor men who will hear a voice coming from the kitchen that might say, Look, I'm doing all the cooking and you're just sitting there drinking beer. So in those circumstances, you would say, I'm cooking, but you'd, you'd put it there just to emphasize the distinction between what I'm doing and what somebody else is doing. Those of you who know Spanish, you'd say, I know is just se, I know. But if you want to say, you know, but I don't know, then you say, tu sabes, pero yo no lo sé. You, you put the pronoun there to em emphasize the difference. And you'll find pretty much the same happens in San Sanskrit and, and, and Pali. And it's the same in the Slavonic languages as well, where the, the, the ending of the verb will often indicate. I see that Iris is nodding. Thank you, Iris. Where the ending of the verb um, demonstrates you know, who, who is doing it, in the present tense, anyway. Um, so, let's look at these, some of these words. Oops, I'm going to... Usual story of running out of time. Um, manusa. I'm looking at the... Um, Okay, I've said manus, so let's carry on with that word for the moment. Manusa means um, a human being. Um, and a lot of these things that the, the fact that it begins with man, and there's a man and a human, by the way, this is um, this. Manusha is non-gendered, means a human being, could be male or, or female. Um, I'm afraid back in Pali speaking times, they only had two genders for people, and goodness knows how they would have managed it nowadays. But um, we'll, we'll, I think we better, you know, for the purposes of this class, better just stick to the two grammatical genders. Um, so Manusha, it's not, it's no coincidence that it begins with a man, because that, again, the manu, the original word man, actually, the root man, is the same as the inter Latin that has become mens, from which we get mental, meaning relating to the mind, so, and thinking. The idea being that when they they had this word man manyate to, to think, so that the human being was the the thinking creature, the thinking the the, the creature that had the ability to to think. And the ushya in Sanskrit it was an ushya ending, just meaning belonging to that species. So manusha, in Pali manusa, 
means just belonging to the, the thinking species is the analysis of, of, of that word. So when we talk about mankind, it effectively, we're talking about the thinking kind, you know, the, the creatures who can think. Um, let's now look at this word kasaka in the, you know, the left-hand column of the vocabulary. Now here, I'm digressing a little bit just to show you a bit of fun etymology. Some of you have heard this last year, many of you will not have. So kasaka, meaning a farmer. Right, now if you're, if you're coming to this cold for the first time, um, many of you will say, okay, right, looks like a random series of noises, just got to learn that it means farmer. Yeah, but there's a little more to the story. And the reason I make no apology for going down these etymological rabbit holes is not only because you know, for me, it's enormous fun. But it really helps you to learn the word, to remember the word, to follow these traces back from our modern languages, be we speakers of Germanic, Slavonic, or, or um, Italic languages, to follow those back and say, wow, we're using almost the same word now with a few little variations, phonetic variations over the thousands of years. So, kasaka, in, it's from, oops, it, sorry, screen, it's from the root krish, sorry, Um, that we give these roots, by the way, in their, their old Vedic form for um, a reason I'll explain when the opportunity arises, hopefully very soon. Krish. The original meaning of that is to, is to, uh, to scratch, meaning scratching the earth, the old fashioned plowing. Um, and somebody who did it in Sanskrit, it is a, um, a karshaka. Sorry. When we write assert with this little, that's the um, palatal sh sound, a, a Sanskrit karshaka, and by standard phonetic mutation, karshaka in Sanskrit becomes kasaka in Pali. So let's get think of karshaka. From this root, krish, meaning to scratch. Now, this same root has come into German, modern German, Kratzen, meaning to scratch. When it came into English, it somehow managed to put an S on the front of the on the front of the word. So our English word scratch traces back through the Germanic form kratz, which traces back to Vedic times the root. Karsh, karsh, katzen, scratch. That came into the, when you talk about gratiné and so on, the fromage gratiné, gr, you know, grated cheese, is actually originally a Germanic word that was taken into the, into the Latin, Latin languages. So gratinated come, comes from that same one. Now, beautifully, this same word, came into Greek hmm? as, sorry, I haven't written that, well, harasso, meaning I scratch. Harasso in Greek is to, to scrape or, or to etch. And it made in Greek, and something that is etched in, in Greek, you can see the connection there, Sanskrit, karsh, Greek, haras, it's the same word with the phonetic, development, and the Greek word for an etching, I'll write it in Roman script, the Greek word for something that's etched into you is charakteron, which has now come into our modern English as character. So your character isn't just some superficial aspect of you that's painted on the surface. Your character is what is scratched or etched into you. So whenever you talk about the character now, it's the same root as Kersh, Pali Kassako farmer, the same as fromage gratiné, 
gratinated cheese, grated cheese. They, they all go back to that, that ancient root. So hopefully now you'll see when you learn the word kasako, it's not just a random series of noises. You see, ah, it's the person who scratches, you know, the most primitive form of plowing. They had a sharpened piece of wood or stone with which they scratched the, the surface of the, of, of the earth to plant. So now, whenever you see the word kasako, not only will you know what it means, but you'll know the karsh, the scratching, gratinated cheese, and the character, and the kratzen, it's all there. Um, going back to the... Uh, by the way, I should mention, I know this is only lesson one, and some of you beginners are here for the first time. You might think I'm getting too complex. I say no because I'm not dealing with grammatically complex points now. I'm not asking you to learn a whole lot of new grammatical endings all at once. I'm talking about etymology and the history of the words and how they sounded and how they've come into um, modern English and the other mon modern languages. That's why any of you can do that at what, what any stage your knowledge of Sanskrit and Pali has reached. You don't need to know much Sanskrit, for example, or Pali to hopefully to have understood my explanation of kasaka and scratching and character. And, and that is why from a very early stage, we will be dealing at um, some length, I hope, and some depth with the etymology and what these words re really mean. Now, looking, um, we haven't got time to go through in detail in the vocabulary, but just look at a couple of interesting interesting words. If you look at the verbs column on page page one, um, the verbs in column two, let's look at the very first one, bhasati. He, she, or it speaks. Um, Some of you may be familiar, for example, um, with the, the Malay for their own language is Bahasa Malaysia, Bahasa. It's, it's that, same, that same word, the, the, because in, but in Malay, they put a short ah, so it's Bahasa. But there's more to it than that. There, the, there's a medical condition um, known as, it's the Greek word, which we pronounce in English as aphasia, meaning the inability to speak. It's that same word, you see. It's actually from the Greek root um, pe, well, pronounced fi in modern Greek and classical Greek, pronounced pe, meaning to 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 speak. It's from that same ba pe. It's that same root. And so, for example, whenever we talk about a, a prophet, the it's in Greek the prophetis is the person who speaks out. Prophet is that same root. Bas, bashati, to speak out. Um, it came into Latin, that ba came into Latin as fa. Um, so for example, if you're famous, the word fame is people talk about you. It's that same root fa in Latin, ba in, in, in the Vedic root. If something is infamous, it means infamous is so awful it should not be spoken about. That's the meaning of the word infam infamous. Equally, our word, for example, nefarious, your nefarious deeds, that same meaning. So awful that they shouldn't even be mentioned in polite company, literally unspeakable. So infamous and nefarious are actually two different ways in Latin of saying un unspeakable, that which cannot or should not be, be, be spoken. 
Um, Hi, James. Uh, Sardendu has, has, has a hand. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Yes, Sardendu, yeah. please. Uh, it's, uh, I'm just asking that uh, first uh, word you are using, that is Sanskrit, then you are using the uh, Pali, then other languages, or uh, first word you are putting here, that is Pali, and then you are putting the Sanskrit in other languages. So why, why am I introducing Sanskrit into a Pali class? Was that your essential question? Uh, no, actually, uh, first uh, in first uh, slide, uh, it was written over there that uh, Pali and Sanskrit word was there. That's why a little bit of confusion I have. And first time I'm uh, going I, I'm for so, this class. I, I'm, I'm, sorry, sir. Then it's it's coming coming through a bit blurred. Fear, um, Odin, can you hear any better? I'm not hearing well here. Yeah. Um, uh, hmm. I think Sardendu was saying the. F I think he was going to make a further point by saying you you first did a Sanskrit, then a Pali word, and then mm -hmm. I think he was going to refer. I thought he was maybe going to refer back to which word it was yeah. that he was maybe interested in. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I. I... Yeah. Definitely. So I'm sort of left in a slight uncertainty about um, what I'm being, being exactly what, what what I'm being asked. Okay. So um, uh, what I would mention anyway, so even with, whether I have correctly un understood or, or, or not, there is a huge amount in Pali. You see, the original form of the of the Indo-Iranian language when it came into India. Um, originally, you know, something like you know, 2,500 B, B, BC, maybe a little bit after. Um, there was all basically it was essentially one form of language, and from uh, uh, the natural historical development over time, you know, the different languages emerged rather like you know, out of Latin. We have you know, French, Spanish, Italian, Portuguese, Romanian, and so on emerging by historical, um, just by you know, historical aging and by the contact with other speakers who had their influence on it. So a huge amount in Pali might look completely irregular and in incomprehensible. Whereas if you go back to Sanskrit, um, then it all becomes entirely comprehensible why it's like that in, in Pali. For example, um, if you look at if you, kasako, let's look at that example, and the, the verb kasati, you'll see um, in the list of verbs in the right-hand column, kasati, so kasako with a double S, farmer, plowman, kasati with a single S, um, the verb plows, why? Why is it doubled? Um, it's because in Sanskrit, um, it's, Krishati, which by Pali has become Kasati, the, whereas the Karshaka by regular development, Karshaka, so Krishati to Karshaka is kind of a regular mutation in Sanskrit, and there are rules for it. That's, and that, the R and the Sh has morphed into a double S in Pali. So, which explains why you have kasati plows, he plows, and, but, um, sorry, <laughs> kasaka there, but kasaka is a person who plows. So, that explains why it's going to become a double S in, in, in Pali. If you go back to Sanskrit, okay, you haven't done these rules yet, why it's done that, but take it from me, there are very regular precise rules as to why it happens in that way in Sanskrit, krishati karshaka, um, and explains so, so much in, in, in Pali. Those of you who know Spanish, for example, um, decir, to say, hmm? but I said is not deci, which it would be if it was regular, is dije. Now, if you're just learning Spanish from the surface, decir, you've just got to learn, it's irregular, 
I said is dije. Well, you know, what is going on? Why does it become dije? But if you go back to Latin, um, dicere, root dic, it makes an aorist by adding si, and so perfectly regularly in Latin, it becomes dixi, perfectly regular, which by finet, by um, spelling convention is just written dixi with an s, with an x, but is dixi. And once you know what happens in Latin, dicere, dic, dixi, di, then of course by phonetic mutation, you can see why it is that in Spanish. So what appears as a wild, wacky, illogical irregularity designed to torment foreign students, in fact, falls into place and is completely comprehensible once you trace it back to the Latin. Um, and there is so much of that between Sanskrit and, 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 and Pali. So I'm so often referring back to Sanskrit. Um, does that go any of the way at all towards answering your point, um, Sir Sardendu? Yes. Okay. Look, yeah, if, no, if there is anything I haven't got, please feel we're almost out of time for the first um, for the first hour now. Um, if there's um, anything that you don't understand, please always feel free either to drop me an email about it or to leave a thing on Ask the Teacher. I, I positively welcome these, the, the, these queries and with many of them, they're very useful queries that help everyone else as well. And I will deal with them at the uh, ne next lesson. So hopefully this has been of um, some use. Um, it always happens every single time. I, I'm just getting warmed up. Just feel we're starting the real thing and the hour is up. Um, so anyway, that's just the, the passage of time, I suppose, is something we've got to learn to accept because there's precious little else we can do one, one, one discovers in life. So what we'll do then, um, we'll just wind up this hour here because we're on the three, three o'clock. We'll have our brief break and we'll come back um, at 3.15. And at 3.15, we'll be looking at the, um, the Rune Johansson, uh, which hopefully you will have. And in fact, what I'm going to do, I'm just going to call it up onto the shared screen now and I'll leave it live. Let me just find it for you. And I'll call it onto shared screen. Ah, I've been now. Is it with you? Can you see the the word document? Okay, fine, because we we're having a problem before. I put three readings onto one one document here. So there we are. As I say, those of you who are starting polygrammer for the first time, fear not. Um, we are not getting into highly complex grammar. In fact, the grammar of this, although this is you know, this is real original stuff, the grammar here is very simple anyway and we'll be looking at the analysis of the words. Okay, I will um, see you again in um, 15 minutes, hopefully all of you. <laughs>